We are now in Belgium mm -hmm. and uh, you work in Ukraine and you go back this week. Well, I, I'm the director of the Pinchuk Art Center, um, which is the largest institution for contemporary art in Ukraine. And we, we have an open institution even today. So we have ongoing exhibitions, we have an ongoing program. And as we have also our team there who is working every day, it's essential to be there. It's essential to be part of, um, of the daily work on one hand. And on the other hand, I think you can only effectively um, function as a director of an institution if you understand what is going on on the ground. And I think today we have also the exceptional task of leading a cultural, say, front where one creates a real conversation about Ukraine, trying to defend Ukraine on the cultural front, as one should not forget that Putin started from the claim that Ukraine has no culture and is no culture, which is obviously untrue. But from the moment such a claim is being put forward, I think it's um, essential to answer in a culturally driven way and to be able to do that also on the international scene. One really needs to know what's going on today in Ukraine and um, to be able to represent Ukraine in the best possible way. I think it's essential to be there as much as possible. So I myself go every month and um, actually try to go as, as long as possible. I'm now in the Davis Advocate that in war situation, do we need really art for the people, for the masses? It's a very fair question. I think it's a question we asked ourselves when it started in February, on February 24th. I think everybody just stopped because the first thing you're, you're not thinking as the first thing about art. You're thinking about people, you're thinking about saving lives. Um, you're thinking about saving a country, right, rather than saving culture. But this is a, a war of attrition not only on the front, but, only, but also in the cities, also in Ukraine as a whole, there is a war of attrition going on. I think, like with many things, art offers oxygen. It's an oxygen for thinking. It's, um, it's a place for being able to respond and reflect in a non-direct way. So if all culture would stop, then all culture would have stopped for a year. And I think that's an unacceptable situation because it is an other way that Russia and Putin would win this war because Ukraine would lose by uh, definition its own cultural place. And I think in that sense, the decision to engage with culture was a very important one. And I can say it's a decision that was supported by the president of Ukraine because the day that we decided to launch the cultural front was um, when we decided to be present in Venice so the Venice Biennial, which opened in April um, last year, 2022, we had planned a major event with the Future Generation Art Prize, which we cancelled at the moment that the war began. And it was because President Zelensky said to our founder, Mr. Pinchuk, this is important that we have a cultural representation in the strongest possible way, because this is part of the war that we fight and this is part of our story as Ukrainians because art can say things that sometimes we cannot express through words or through texts. For that reason it's essential to be present in the biggest event. As a result President Zelensky opened the exhibition, um, albeit digitally and from distance, and we have had since a, a series of programs from exhibitions to interventions um, that we've done throughout Europe where we continuously try to defend through culture, through art, Ukraine, Ukraine as a nation, Ukraine as an ID, but also uh, as a country at war that needs all possible support that it can get from the West. On the feeling that people have when, when they have nothing to do, they are in a bunker um, for a year now without any entertainment, any theater, any movie or whatever, sometimes electricity, sometimes heating. So, uh, so maybe art could be the way they can uh, define themselves a little better. Yeah, what, what we discovered is that 
um, very fast Ukrainians first wanted to work because even my team who was st staying on the ground who didn't who didn't want to um, leave the country the worst thing we could do is say guys uh, we understand your situation you don't have to work what they wanted to do is to engage and be useful that was the first element the second element is that indeed when you are um, in in such a long-lasting war you want life to still be worth living and it's not worth living when you're sitting in a bunker or doing nothing part of life being worth living is the fact that you are engaging and that you can think and reflect so when we decided to reopen the Pinchukat Center which was in June 2022 we were very afraid about you know will will people will this be relevant for Ukrainians will they will they want to come and will they want to engage and the resonance was amazing the the engagement from Ukrainians the fact that they all flocked back to the museum and that they spent an incredible long time um, with works and and looking feeling inside of the museum we understood that our role is very important because it, it is part of the mental health of a nation so in that sense I think the presence of culture in in every sense through literature through through theater through music through visual arts is a very essential component in keeping Ukraine um, a vivid nation Last year I was in uh, Paris, in the Maison de Photography, MAP, mm -hmm. and there was an exhibition, Boris Mikhailov, mm -hmm. a photographer, well-known photographer. Shouldn't be a good way to, to exhibit more Ukrainian artists in the Western world to, to get some visibility for these artists? He's an incredibly established artist. He is 82 or 83 years old right now, and I think uh, till this day, he is still one of the most respected Ukrainian uh, photographers, um, which we showed, by the way, a fantastic retrospective from on his 80th birthday uh, in Ukraine, together with two French curators, by the way, uh, Alicia Nock, who is curator of uh, Centre Pompidou, and Martin Kiefer, who used to be the head of contemporary art in, in, at the Louvre. So he's a very established name. Um, but to come to your question, already in 2014, when the war started, because we, we shouldn't make a mistake, the war started in 2014, not in, on February 2022. Um, what we saw is that there was an incredible interest in showing Ukrainian art and culture, but it was, a, you know, you, you have these bursts of fire. They can go very hot, but then they disappear. And um, I think the, the mistake of the western cultural world in 2014-2015 was that they made a big burst and then it disappeared the interest um, the engagement disappeared and i think what we should make sure about today is that ukraine and, and not only ukraine but many of what we can call these post-soviet states become an integral part of the ukraine of the western cultural thinking because it's an important way to guarantee cultural independence and it's also important for the West to review their own narrative building which has been very much influenced and pushed by Russian narrative building about culture um, and that's what we are trying to do Ooh, we can go too many directions now. <laughs> we can go to the to the eastern part in in as a such in general with with many small countries and very diverse uh, art culture. But I, I want to reflect also with the, this Russian culture uh, you mentioned that uh, probably uh, I tried to read all the art newspapers in the world, but I, I haven't well recognized that the Russian things. Maybe the Chukin collection showing in in Foundation Louis Vuitton, that was, a, that was a, okay, an inevitable uh, point. Let me give you two simple examples and, and I think you will understand what I mean. The first example is there was several years ago this big donation to Centre Pompidou called Collectia. Collectia was a donation that was, that was collected throughout um, or with the money of private um, Russian donors 
and that brought together I don't know how many works I, I, I will not put a number on it but a massive amount of works that come from what you could look at the Soviet space mm -hmm. that was promoted as a Russian cultural heritage but if you look at it if you look at what is in there then you will discover that many of the artists represented do not consider themselves Russian or part of the Russian cultural world. That many artists in there are from Ukraine, from Georgia, from Kazakhstan, from places where um, cultural identity and specifically the way that art has developed has disconnected from a Soviet to Russia. That's the first answer. The second answer is Russia has, from the moment that the Soviet Union collapsed, appropriated Soviet culture as being Russian. Now one needs to ask questions about that. And that's not so much, that's, that's actually a language and that has penetrated every institution. Yeah. Uh, I was in the Netherlands and I was looking at who made certain works and they were defined as Russians. While they were Soviet artists at the time, some of them Russian, some of them not so Russian. And the question that one needs to ask themselves is, is one, is Soviet culture really Russian? Two, what has been appropriated and how can one disconnect that? And I don't claim to have the answer. I don't claim that the answer is, is obvious. But the fact that no independent thinking or research goes into that from leading Western institutions who own some of the best collections of Soviet art is a big problem. And the first step in disempowering the Russian cultural colonial narrative that still today has a leading place in uh, the cultural conversation is by not accepting by default what Russian experts, for example, from the Hermitage, say about uh, Soviet art. I don't think many people know actually names or, or let's say, famous in that uh, in that area artists. Uh, even myself and I, uh, I can tell you some names, but not that many artists so maybe could you tell me just some some names who, who should we look at and and start uh, searching ukrainian visual arts yeah. culture let's say is a very rich uh, area and um if if you ask me to tell you names i will not be exhaustive because there's so many but some of the names who have received already attention and representation say like this uh, abroad it's boris Mikhailov you mentioned or sergey bratkov both of them coming from what you call the Kharkiv School of Photography. Um, then you have a younger generation with people like Jana Kadyrova, who was represented um, by Continua Gallery um, and at the same time had, had a very big and impactful representation in Venice, to Nikita Kadan, who is in all major uh, European collections uh, already represented. And then you have even younger artists coming. So there's a very, like uh, Yarema, uh, Malashuk and Roman Himei, two fantastic strong video makers. And just to give some names, these are already people who have real representation within a broader European context, some of them very active in the USA. And I think it's only the beginning. Uh, one of the things I can advise is to, to really look at what we, we have, this Pinchuk Arts Enterprise, um, which has been running since 2009. Uh, which every two years brings together about 20 Ukrainian artists, um, young Ukrainian artists, out of which many are growing and are getting to these international scenes, telling their stories. And I think that's something one, one can really look at. Lesha Khomenko, for example, fantastic painter, um, who is now having a residence in, in the USA, who has really received a lot of, a lot of attention, or Yevgenia Belarusits, who is a writer, but also an artist. People we took to Venice in the last biennial open group, a younger group of artists who has made actually incredibly strong work uh, throughout the last 10 years. 
there's so many names I can uh, bring forth. Actually, can you deliver an art piece to, to Kiev now? Is, is it possible? It is possible. Mm. We, have, we have opened, as I said, we opened in June. It's a project I uh, launched together with my friend and director of, of um, MUCA here in Antwerp, Bart de Bare. So we, we brought together the collection, and actually the Flemish collection of MUCA to Ukraine which is a national collection yeah, in, in Belgium collections are from the regions, not, not federalized. And uh, this collection could not be insured, however. Um, it's an important collection with very high value works. So uh, Barta Bare got the permission from the government and minister president who said, we'll take the risk. Meaning works don't have to be insured, but of course what we needed to assure was professional art transport, professional handling, handling and, 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 and good conditions for the exhibition. Because if you look at, you know, Ukraine, of course, Ukraine is a country at war, but it doesn't mean that Kyiv is a war zone. Kyiv and Bakhmut are quite far from each other. So Kyiv is a city that functions as a city. And yes, there are rocket attacks every day. And yes, there are electricity cuts every day. But that doesn't mean that the city as such is not alive. And we could assure, thanks to an art transporter that we work with in Ukraine, that the works would be professionally shipped. We assured an insurance for the works with exclusion of war damages. So whenever something would happen within the territory of the museum, that is a normal damage, a visitor doing something or installation mistake, that would be covered by the insurances. But of course, any real war damage, that wouldn't be covered. And there the Flemish government said, we, we take that responsibility. So it allowed us as an institution to actually open with an international collection that we put in conversation with fantastic works of Ukrainian artists that were made during the war. It gave us a, a really impact full exhibition that also had a lot of in international intention um, and we showed them later in Köln uh, once again. Last year I was in uh, Bihać in Bosnia which is still uh, far from the established country you know there are many disputes between okay many nationality let's not go too into details mm -hmm. but it's still um, you know the government is still not control over parts of the country and what I saw here uh, artistically, uh, because there are many ways to, to see that the government is not in taking full responsibilities, but the, what is most important for me that the artworks are being a little bit transformed because more and more weapons are in the pictures, more and more drama, more and more um, situa war situation, let's say. Is it, is it happening also with the Ukrainian artists? An artist creates from where they are. An artist doesn't create from a void. They create from a reality in which they live. So is war a subject? For sure it is a subject. It's unavoidable to make it a subject. I think every artist would not want to talk about war, but they have no other choice since that's the world they live in today. Does it mean that they directly make a propagandistic reflection on the war? No, absolutely not. They voice the situation differently. They give attention to elements that sometimes can be forgotten. They look at the war, hopefully from a certain distance when they can create. And I think it, it makes for sometimes incredibly strong works that go far beyond the situational context of the war in Ukraine, but reflects back at our own humanity or our own relation towards human life. But of course, it's, it's connected to the war in Ukraine because every Ukrainian has a friend or a family member who is affected by war, either through the loss of houses or through the loss of life. Thank you very much.
for the discussion. <laughs> You're very welcome.